Hello, early American literature friends. This is a guide through the 19th and 20th removes of Mary Rowlandson's narrative of the captivity and restoration. So the last two removes, this gets you to the end. The last two are a little bit long though, so we're taking them on just by themselves. Um, this gets you, she already knows she's going home, she's been sent for, they're going, the Native Americans are going to ransom her her and the 19th remove starts off with they said when we went out that we must travel to Wachusett this day but a weary a weary bitter weary day I had of it traveling now three days together without resting any day between so you're getting those one of the things that you get with the removes is they they travel and then rest for a while and she's saying they travel for three days straight and it sort of exhausted her here they're having a remove with no breaks between the removes uh, here you get at last, after many steps, I saw Wachusett Hill, but many miles off, many miles off, she can see that the sort of redemption rock, the place where they go to trade um, captives, to trade prisoners. You get a little bit of typology there um, with the Christian, the biblical book of Psalms, uh, but I may say as in Psalms 94 verse 18, when my foot slipped, thy mercy, O, o Lord, held me up. She has a brief interaction with King Philip who promises her, he says, yes, and quickly you shall come to your master again, who had been gone from us three weeks. Um, going along, having indeed my life, but little spirit, Philip, who was in the company, came up and took me by the hand and said, two weeks more and you shall be mistress again. And be mistress again, by that he means you won't be a servant to Wiedemu, you'll be your own master again, you'll be your mistress again. So he's promising her that she'll be, that when they get to Wachusett, she will be ransomed. And then she gets to Wachusett and she sees Quinnipin, her master, Wiedemu um, is one of Quinnipin's three wives. He asked me when I had washed myself, I told him not this month, obviously not, not great hygiene conditions going on as you're going through the woods. He fetched me some water himself, bid me wash, gave me the glass to see how I looked. By glass, she means like a mirror, a looking glass or something. Bid his squaw give me something to eat. This is another squaw, not Wiedemu. Um, he has, Wiedemu is his middle wife in terms of age. He has an older wife who is very nice to Mary Rowlandson in this section. And then a younger wife who he has three children with, or two children with. Uh, she gave me a mess of beans and meat and a little ground nut cake. Uh, so you see her, she gets to wash. She can see herself in the mirror. She gets a good meal. My master had three squaws um, in that, first, that second paragraph of the 19th remove uh, is the act where she explains the three wives. Um, the the oldest wife who is helping Mary Rowlandson here, Wiedemu, who is the middle wife, a severe and proud dame she was. And then a third squaw was a younger one by whom he had two papooses. Um, there's also, at the, towards the end of that second paragraph, she says, also, I was not a little glad to hear this being by it raised in my hopes that in God's due time, there would be an end to this sorrowful hour. She can sort of see the end in sight. She has faith that, that this is coming to an end. Then came Tom and Peter with the second letter from the council about the captives. That they were Indians, I got them by the hand and burst out into tears. Another, she's so close to being free and she just burst out into tears. My heart was so full. I asked them how my husband did. They are all very, and all my friends and acquaintances, they said they're all very well, but melancholy. They brought me two biscuits and a pound of tobacco. She eats the biscuits, trades the tobacco to the other Native American. Uh, and then in that third paragraph, they have this council meeting, the Native American council meets, and they bring her in and ask her how much they think they should ask for her for to be ransomed. And she says, I knew not yet where it would be procured, yet at a venture I said 20 pounds, yet desired them to take less. But they would not hear of that, sent that message to Boston that for 20 pounds I should be redeemed. And so they send the message back to the general court in Boston if the, um, you have to remember this is still a British colony, so they're using British pounds so for 20 pounds. Um, she, got, she goes on this long description of praying Indians, this attack on praying Indians, again, to reinforce her idea that praying Indians are, are sort of double agents. They're, they're never really totally. She even says, there was another praying Indian so wicked and cruel as to wear a string about his neck, strung with Christian fingers. Another praying Indian, when they went to the Sudbury fight, went with them, his squaw also with him with her papoose at her back. Um, and, and so she makes this long, she says, there is this sort of 
the praying Indians are still Indians and, and you can't really trust them because they're sort of playing both sides. Uh, she describes the ceremony before they attack the colonial town of Sudbury on April 18th, right before she is freed, there's another attack. So they ended their business and, business and forthwith went to the Sudbury fight. That is right in the middle of that long last paragraph of the, ni the 19th remove. The, ni the end of the 19th remove is really only important. You, there's a scene at the end where she sits with this guy and he gives her food and then she sees that behind her seat there are the the bloody and bloody clothes of some people that he killed that i saw bloody clothes with bullet holes in them yet the lord suffered not this wretch to do me any hurt she gives this description of the native americans and how they could be nice to you but also then participate in these raids and attacks on towns uh but the whole point of this last section and and really the last sort of half of this last paragraph of the 19th remove is her she doesn't come out and say it, but she is describing, and even the Native Americans seem to know, it's it's April here, it's springtime, and by the time you get to fall in the end of 1670, 1676, King Philip's War will be over. She is kidnapped in the middle, towards the end, you know, middle end of it. Um, and she, there is a suggestion in this that even the Native Americans know that like the end of their in the end of their resistance is coming. That they're having success raiding all these towns like Sudbury and Lancaster, which was her town, but that like their ability to keep up, to keep going and keep like running all over the wilderness and doing these sort of guerrilla attacks, it can't last forever. They're they're you know they're surviving on ground nuts and acorns and whatever they can find, just like she is. Like they're not withholding food from her. She's eating what they can eat. They're struggling to get by as they conduct these wilderness raids. And in many time, in many cases, they're surviving on the food they get from these raids. And so her point here is, as she is reflecting on it, this is the late, sort of the Native Americans' last big push. These raids and like the Sudbury raid, because by the time you get to the end of the summer. King Philip's War, it's April now, and by the time you get to the end of the summer, in a few months, King Philip's War will be winding down and then be over by the end of the year, and King Philip himself will be dead. And then you get to the 20th remove. We went about three or four miles, and there they built a great wigwam big enough to hold 100 Indians, which they did in preparation for a great day of dancing. Um, sh there is this scene in this first paragraph where they refuse to allow her to see her sister or daughter who are also being held nearby. The suggestion of that, the general way that is interpreted is, they're like, don't don't be going around visiting people. We're getting ready to trade you back. We can't, can't risk losing you. You stay here where we can see you and control you till we can get you traded back, get you ransomed, um, get our ransom money. Uh, a man named John Orr, who was a lawyer, but also a famous hostage negotiator between the colonists and the Indians, um, comes and he negotiates Mary Rowlandson's release. In that second paragraph, it says, on a Sabbath day, the sun being about an hour high in the afternoon, came Mr. John Orr, the council permitting him. He brings two of the Tom and Peter, the two praying Indians, they come with him. Um, there is this long description of the, the sort of interactions that they have with Mr. Orr, including the Native Americans there steal his food, which sort of reinforces the idea that they're struggling to get by, that they would steal food from from like an ambassador from the colonies. Uh, there is some typology. If you've got the book, it's at the bottom of page 286. There's a reference to Daniel in the lion's den, famous biblical story where Daniel is a Christian who is thrown to the lions by the Romans, but God makes it so that the lions don't eat or attack him. Um, oh, that we could believe that there is nothing too hard for God. God showed his power over the heathens in this as he did over the hungry lions when Daniel was cast into the den. Again, she sort of equates her captivity and especially the end of her captivity and her release to Daniel surviving the lion's den and being released by the Romans. There is all of, there is this ceremony um, that the natives have, particularly Quinnipin and Weedamu. They get all dressed up for these negotiations. Um, and then in this sort of twist, there is this when we were laying down, my master went out of the wigwam and by and by sent in an Indian called James the Printer, another praying Indian, who told Mr. Orr that my master would let me go home tomorrow if he would let him have one pint of liquors. And there is this sort of darkly funny scene where Mr. Orr gives them the pint of liquor, um, some, something like um, probably in this time that would have meant um, some kind of gin 
Uh, they give him the gin, uh, and he said two coats and twenty shillings. And King Philip asked for some money too. Um, Quinnipin takes the liquor and gets drunk. Uh, and John Orr gives them all of the things that they're asking for. There is this moment where Mary Rowlandson said, "Yet I had not a comfortable night's rest." This is after Quinnipin gets drunk, and it's sort of unclear. It's clear that they're negotiating, and the negotiations are close to being done, but not, you know, they're not set in stone. She's not released yet. I had not a comfortable night's rest, for I think I can say I did not sleep for three nights together. The night before the letter came from the council, I could not rest. I was so full of fears and troubles. This is, it's, it's significant that she says, you know, three nights. You have this almost connection. She doesn't explicitly say it, but she's um, making this vague connection to the, de the death and then the resurrection of Jesus uh, at Easter in Christian iconography and mythology from um, the from Easter from Good Friday to Easter Sunday she has three three nights where she can't sleep and then she is redeemed and freed she rises again into freedom she's alive and free again on Tuesday morning they're called they're, they call their general court as they called it um, and they all as one man did seemingly consent that I should go home except for Philip who would not come among them King Philip doesn't feel like he, he got what he was owed out of the deal Quinnipin got, got the liquor and some other stuff. She gives you this list then. Um, she like sort of jumps in and takes a break and gives you this list of four things. It is mainly this her articulation of how the army failed to rescue them. And she's not really criticizing the army. She's just saying one of the things that made this last so long is the army came close a couple of times but never succeeded. Of the fair opportunity lost in the long march a little, a little after the fort fight when our English army was so no, numerous. This is her saying that the attack on Lancaster came right after the English army had an attack, had an, had an opportunity to wipe out or severely like capture a bunch of Native Americans. The English army failed to do it and, and then the Lancaster attack came right after that. I cannot but remember how the Indians derided the slowness and dullness of the English army in its setting out. The Native, and that's number two, the Native Americans talk about how the English army is so slow but it's because the English army has to set up supply lines like they're fighting like a traditional European army setting up supply lines instead of just like going through the wilderness and eating as they can find and things like that. Which I also have hinted before when the English army with new supplies were sent forth this is the part where she says they almost caught the natives at the river but then they couldn't cross the Bangkok River. It was thought, then number four, it was thought that if their corn were cut down, they would starve and die with hunger. This is where she do is this plan um, earlier in King Philip's War to burn or destroy all of the Native American corn, and that would like starve them out, force them to either move west and make room for the colonists, or that they would simply starve and not be able to survive. It was this sort of cutting off of the Native American food supply. Mary Rowlandson says, that in her experience that that didn't work that i did not see all the time i was among them one man woman or child die with hunger but that is also because like they you see as she describes in the book they're eating ground nuts and acorns and horse feet and stuff like that like it does if you want to be practical about it the english strategy of burning all the corn does succeed because the native americans they, they are in some degree starving though not as quickly as mary rollinson maybe seems to want them to um their chief and commonest food was ground nuts. Again, those are native to New England. We don't have them in the South, but um, they would pick up old bones, cut them to pieces at the joints. If they were full of worms and maggots, they would scald them over the fire to make the vermin come out, boil them and drink up the liquor. Again, they would eat horses guts, ears, wild birds, bear, venison, beaver, tortoise, frogs, squirrels, dogs, skunks, rattlesnakes, yea, the very bark of trees. They would make tree bark soup. Uh, in this in a kind of similar way to like tapping trees in New England for for maple syrup and stuff like that but she is saying like her point is they could eat anything and survive but she is also sort of unintentionally making the point that the burning all the corn forced them to live like this and live hand-to-mouth in this way you get the fifth point that she makes another thing I would observe is the strange providence of God turning things about when the Indians were at their highest and the English at the lowest this is her explanation that right after she is released in the summer of 1676. The Indians have all these successful raids in the spring, but the tide turns in the summer. And so that by the time you get to the fall and the winter, at the end of 1676, um, King Philip's war is over and Philip is dead. But to return again to my going home, 
where we may see a remark remarkable change of providence. If you don't know what providence is, that is their word, a word that was really popular and common in the 1600s, 1700s for like the will of God, what God wanted to have happen. She talks about providence and it's God's will that now she has suffered for almost uh, 12 months or 12 weeks, I'm sorry, three months. And now she, God's, God has protected her and now it's God's will for her to be released and go home. She talks about how she had the opportunity a couple of times people ask her if she wanted to run away. She never wanted to run away because she had faith that she would be rescued. There is, she makes another connection to Daniel and the lion's den um, right after that as well. It's on page 290 if you have the book. She, so I took my leave of them and in coming along, this is, she is released now and walking back towards Lancaster and then back towards Boston. Coming along, my heart melted into tears more than all the while I was with them. I was almost swallowed up with the thoughts that ever I should go home again. So when she is finally released and going home, she's with Mr. Orr and the two, um, the two praying Indians, Tom and Peter. She just has this breakdown, melts down, um, cries more than she says she's ever cried when she was a prisoner. About the sun going down, Mr. Orr and myself and the two Indians came to Lancaster, a solemn sight it was to me. There I had lived many comfortable years, and now not one Christian to be seen, no one, nor one house left standing. And Lancaster was burned to the ground. No houses were left standing, and it was never rebuilt. Um, other towns were built around it, but it was never rebuilt. You see this marker right here where Mary Rowlandson's house was, but there's just no town there. There's, there's just... Lanc other towns were rebuilt, but not Lancaster. Um, they sleep in a farmhouse that, that first night um, further east. And then the next day they get to Concord, Massachusetts. Um, and she encounters, there I met with my brother and my brother-in-law who asked me if I knew where his wife was. Poor heart, he had helped to bury her and knew it not. Um, her brother-in-law, this is the sister who was killed in her house right at the beginning of the story. Um, her brother-in-law, the point she's making is her brother-in-law, like her husband was away during the attack, he comes back and buries the dead bodies, the burned bodies and stuff like that, but doesn't know what's happened to his wife. He helped bury his wife and didn't even know it. And so Mary Rollinson has to tell him, no, she died. She then uh, meets her husband. Being recruited with food and raiment, we went to Boston that day where I met with my dear husband. But the thoughts of our dear children, one being dead, the others we could not tell where abated our comfort upon each other. So like, they're obviously happy to be reunited. She has to tell him that, that Sarah, their six year old died in the wilderness and the other two children are still are still captive. So they have to worry about their, uh, about them. She explains that her ransom was paid by this sort of fundraising effort in Boston, which is relatively common. They're worried for the children, um, her sister, and then her sister and Mrs. Kettle, who she mentioned before early in the story, are ransomed. Um, the week following after my coming in, the governor and council sent forth to the Indians again, that not without success, for they brought in my sister and good wife Kettle. There's that, there's that sentence. And then right after that, that which was dead lay heavier upon my spirit than those which were alive, and I was no way able to relieve it, how it was buried in the heathen in the wilderness from among all Christians. This is her thinking about Sarah, and she's obviously wanting her children to be released, but she knows that she has, she has one child that she's never going to get back, and it's obviously like weighing heavily on her, on her mind and her heart. We thought we, and she and her husband decide they're going to ride east to see if we could hear anything concerning our children. As we were riding along between Ipswich and Rowley, those are two, two towns in Massachusetts around in the Boston area, uh, who, the, we met with Mr. William Hubbard, who told us our son Joseph was come in to Major Waldron's and another with him, which was my sister's son. So as they're riding along, they get the news that Joseph, their son, has been released. And they get to New... So long we went till we came to Newberry, their minister being absent, absent, they desired my husband to preach the Thanksgiving for them. He was not willing to stay there that night, but we'll go over to Salisbury to hear further. So he's like, no, I'm going to... They want him to... People in the town want him to preach because their minister's not there. He wants to keep going, go find his son. Um which he did and preached there that day at night. When he had done, one came and told him that his daughter was now coming at Providence. Here was mercy, mercy on both hands. So within a day or two, uh, their, their son is released and then their daughter is escapes. They don't have to pay any ransom for her, which she explains on the next page. Uh, Joseph, their son, is ransomed for seven pounds. Now we were between them, the one on the east, the other on the west. Our son being nearest, we went to him to Portsmouth where we met with him. 
and with the major, who told us he had done what he could, but he could not redeem him under seven pounds, which the good people thereabouts were pleased to pay. So as was common during this time period and during King Philip's War, people in the town raise money, they get this person back. Going back through Newberry, my husband preached there on the Sabbath day, for which they rewarded him many fold. On Monday, we went to Charlestown. If you know Charlestown, that is now what is the in the north end of Boston. Um, and they, the Indians were now gone that way, so it was apprehended dangerous to go to her. So they can't, they're not able to go get her because they're having more Indian raids in that area. But the English army brings her on a supply cart down um, from that area to Boston. But the carts which carried provisions to the English army being guarded brought her with them to Dorchester where we received her. So they get Joseph back and then they, they go to get Joseph and then Mary is brought back to them. Um, here, her coming in was after this manner. She was traveling one day with the Indians with her basket at her back. The company of Indians got before her and gone out of sight, all except one squaw. She followed the squaw till night, till night and then both of them lay down having nothing over them but the heavens, nothing under them but the earth. She, thus she traveled three days together, not knowing wh whither she was going. And at last they came into Providence. So they just get sort of, they fall behind with the natives that they are with, get lost and then wander into town. Um, so Mary is not, doesn't have to be ransomed because she just wanders into town and is, is free. Um, the Indians often said that I should never have her under 20 pounds, but now the Lord has brought her in free cost and given her to me a second time. The first time, obviously, she was when she was born, and now she, they get her back the second time. Our family being now gathered together, those of us that were living, the South Church in Boston hired a house for us. That's the beginning. Of, there's a um, description in that paragraph about how um, the church gives them a house, people give them furniture, give them food. They are provided for because obviously they have nothing because everything they had was wiped out in the attack on Lancaster. One of the more famous paragraphs in this whole book is that next paragraph, which begins, I can remember the time when I used to sleep quietly without workings in my thoughts, whole nights together, but now it is other ways with me. When all are fast, and by fast she means like locked and secure, about me and no eye open, his, but his whoever waketh, my thoughts are upon things past, the awful dispensation of the Lord towards us. I remember in the night season when she was a captive, how the other day I was in the midst of thousands of enemies, but nothing but death before me. It was then hard work to persuade myself that I should ever be satisfied with bread again. And then you skip down to, I watered my couch with my tears. Oh, the wonderful power of God that my eyes have seen affording matter enough for my thoughts to run in that when others are sleeping, my eyes are weeping. This is generally read as this paragraph is often read. And this is the reason it's so important as her sort of post-traumatic stress and her she can't sleep through the night anymore because she's worried that, you know, um, her home might be attacked, her, her children, her family taken away from her. And the sort of weeping, the water on my couch with tears when others are sleeping, my eyes are weeping, the sort of weeping for Sarah and all that she went through and all that she lost. The cost of, of what she, of this experience. Before I knew what affliction, then you get the last paragraph. Before I knew what affliction meant, I was ready sometimes to wish for it. When I lived in prosperity, and um, I saw other people in sickness, weakness, poverty, losses, crosses, and I should sometimes be jealous, lest I should have my portion in this life. Uh, and so she is saying, like, she had always lived comfortably. Her life had been easy before this happened, and she always, like, she saw other people suffering and struggling. Um, but now I see the Lord has his time to scourge and chasten me. This portion of some is to have their affliction by drops, one drop and then another. But the dregs of the cup, the wine of astonishment, like a sweeping rain that leaves no food, did the Lord prepare to be my portion. And so she says, like some people suffer in bits and pieces and moments. I got all my suffering at once in a big flood that washed over me. Um, she got all of her suffering all at once in this, this big, um, big swarm. Uh, like a sweeping rain that leaveth no food. Um, and she makes this connection at the end of that paragraph to King David um, in the Old Testament. As David did, it is good for me that I've been afflicted because it tested her faith and God carried her through it would be her argument. It was but the other day that if I had the world, I would have given it for my freedom or to have been a servant to a Christian. I've learned to look beyond present and smaller troubles and to be quieted under them. And she says, like, that's the lesson at the end of the book, or is like, there's a moral to the story. It is for her, she argues, God carried me through this, and I have learned to, like, um, 
to to be quiet, uh, to look beyond the present and smaller troubles and be quiet and, and to sort of like be at peace with what God is giving her or putting her through or those kinds of things is where she concludes the whole story. The conclusion is obviously she is ran. The, the bigger conclusion as you reading the book is she gets ransomed back. Um, she gets jo they get Joseph back. They get the daughter Mary back and then they are in Boston. Uh, she never again, and understandably so, she never again lives on a frontier town. Um, her husband is, uh, um, and her husband dies the next year after this. He is a minister in another town. Um, and then shortly after that, she moves to Boston and is never in this sort of frontier situation again. Hopefully that helps you understand the ending of the book, especially that long last 20th remove, which is, which is a little overwhelming because it's so long and bigger than the rest of them. I hope this book has been super interesting to you. It's about a you know part of American history that, that you're still 100 years away from the American Revolution. You're deep into the time period of the British colonies and these sort of conflicts that the colonists were having as they pushed the frontier west um, away from the coast and away from where people like John Smith and William Bradford, you know, the, the, they, the frontier and the, the colonists have moved away from the coast and started moving inland. And this shows you one of the things that happened as the frontier began moving west in, into the interior parts of the country is these conflicts with Native Americans.